So um, <clears throat> my contribution to this meeting is to give you a historical perspective on the construction of genome scale models that we call GEMS because they are so valuable, both from a scientific standpoint as well as a practical one. Uh, I've been doing this for now almost 30 years, and uh, it used to be said, and I think this is still true, that if you can't build a predictive model for the red blood cell, forget everything else. Because this is literally the simplest cell that you can study, and it's actually quite important. In the late 80s, we had kinetic models uh, available of the um, known metabolism in the cell built and published. There was always this nagging doubt, though, about the content of the model. Are we missing something? What is it, what is it that we don't know about the cell? And I'm sure this is a, a doubt that many of you are familiar with. Now, of course, uh, 30 years later, we have a full um, se um, re -se sequencing of the human genome. We can identify the metabolic genes. We have deep proteomic uh, data sets for the uh, red blood cell, and we can uh, construct the actual metabolic map. And this little green area in here is this map uh, seen uh, in detail, and as known in the late 80s, or mid 80s, I should say. So in the 90s, we actually saw the uh, beginnings of genome scale science uh, develop. This image here published in TIPS, or the precursor of this image was published in TIPS by David Goodsell. This had a big impact on me and many others because this is truly a cell scale view, maybe a biophysical view. I understand David is here. I've never met him. I would love to talk to him if, if he is here. Uh, then, of course, Craig Venter came out with the first genome in uh, 1995, and we started getting a genome scale view from a sequence uh, standpoint and an annotation standpoint. And then here at UCSD in the late 90s, we actually started to build genome scale models for metabolism that uh, uh, allowed us to compute um, strain-specific and cell-specific properties. This actually worked quite well, and at the turn of the century, we had some of these models uh, working. And after studying them for a few years, it became clear that we had a path ahead of us to two genome scale models, because you could reconstruct transcriptional regulatory networks, protein synthesis, cell cycle, and all the other um, functions of a cell, and you could integrate them in one foul swoop if you had this uh, chemically represented and a stoichiometric representation of the, uh, of the reactions. So this uh, vision was put forth in 2003 by and a review paper by Jenny Reed, uh, where we not only forecasted the uh, genome scale reconstructions, but also the fact that these were containers uh, for mapping uh, multiple uh, omics data types on them. And this indeed all has proven to be, um, uh, uh, well, not true, but it's becoming true. Here at UCSD, then, we decided to uh, uh, try to build a model like this for the simplest cell type there is, which was uh, mycoplasma genitalium. And at that time, we didn't know that much about the cell, so we wanted to do it a stripped-down version of it uh, in, in silico. And we did, decided to call it UCSD uh, for U <laughs> UCSD as an in silico model in Naguratis. We stepped away from this uh, and decided to pursue uh, um, E. coli. But I think, as everyone uh, in the room knows, uh, Marcus Colbert, who uh, is now at Stanford, has actually completed uh, the construction of this model. I put this in for um, Phil Bourne's benefit. Uh, in April of 2005, we came over to the computer uh, center here and talked about building a three-dimensional rendering of the good cell uh, drawings, where you would actually be able to calculate things, biophysical properties, flows, uh, fluxes, and so forth. And I guess we were a little bit ahead of our time, as evidenced by this uh, meeting and the statement of all the difficulties that this entails. So we wised up a little bit around 2005 and realized the magnitude of this problem and how difficult this would uh, be, how difficult this uh, uh, undertaking really is. Conceptually, of course, we want to go from a genome to a phenotypic function, and we had realized since the, then that this is a very complicated workflow that in, in, uh, involves very sophisticated data integration, QCQA, very rigorous step-by-step uh, -step mathematical implementation. And what I'd like to do is to show you uh, what the content of some of these boxes is and how this has come about. So like I said, at the turn of the century, we had uh, metabolic models at a genome scale that uh, have proven predictive and have been reduced to practice for a number of things over the last 10 years most notably perhaps in industrial biotechnology, but more and more now in infectious disease, as well as environmental microbiology, and there are a number of reviews that show how this is done. 
It turns out that building the entire protein synthesis machinery of a cell is not easy. In E. coli, this re relies on 200, uh, excuse me, 423 genes or so, and Ines Thiele, who was a student here in bioinformatics, did this, uh, built this uh, matrix and this model and published it in 2009. Uh, we have also now, with a, a battery of new experimental methods, been able to build um, models of what's actually uh, on bacterial genomes, and as I think everybody knows, this is a, a, a much a more complicated and richer situation than we thought. But we can now lay on top of a genome map like this multiple omics data types, proteomics transcription, uh, start site sequencing, um, expression profiling, chip chip data, and so forth. And this has led to uh, what we call the meta structure of a genome, because there's much more to a genome than simply its three dimensional structure and base pair sequence. And who knows how many dimensions there are? And they seem to be growing. And the first one of these meta structures came out in the fall of 2009 and made the cover of Nature Biotech. And we now have a few of these for uh, various bacteria. We have now begun to integrate uh, metabolism and expression. And this is kind of an important uh, model because this allows us to compute the entire molecular biology of a cell and all its metabolic requirement in one foul swoop and balance the entire process. And this is what I wanted to spend the whole uh, talk on, but I thought it would be a little too myopic, and I wanted to see you this bigger picture. But what we can do here now is we can actually calculate the functional proteome of a cell that is needed to carry out all the functions of the cell in a particular environment. And you can then compute the, ex the computed, you can then plot the computed functional proteome under two different growth conditions and see the changes that are in it. You can then go on and do experiments and expression profile under these two conditions, and it turns out that uh, at least in this particular study, the uh, differentially expressed genes correspond to the differentially computed ones. You can then go in and evaluate this data. You can look at the uh, uh, promoters uh, for these genes, discover uh, regulatory motifs, and you can actually go in and correct the uh, notation of the genome. So this is an iterative uh, loop of computation and experiments that is being practiced now. This was published this year, and I believe Josh, Teddy, and Daniel are all in the audience here. But basically, this model has the full content of this image uh, uh, f uh, from uh, GoodCell, except uh, we don't have any three-dimensional uh, properties of the protein accounted for here. There is now enough data available to build the full um, transcription unit architecture of bacterial genomes. And that's what this uh, here shows. And we now have. Um, uh, uh, this map is not published yet, but we, there are about 4,000 independently addressable elements on the E. coli genome. Then the bigger picture, of course, is to integrate all of these things into a coherent model. Uh, we have not been so interested in the cell cycle because most bacterial applications are population-based, but we have the cell cycle also reconstructed, and I think we can compute probably a whole cell properties of this sort uh, within a couple of years. Finally, we are now mapping protein structures on here. Roger Chang, uh, who was co-advised by Phil Bourne and me, just graduated uh, last week. And we have now full representation of all the protein structures in the metabolic model. And this has allowed us to compute uh, the thermal stability of the entire proteome, predict growth rate as a function of temperature, predict uh, intervention in metabolism by antibiotics, and so forth. And remarkably, this has proven to be quite predictive. So my last slide here. Uh, I just want to show that we have now gone through three phases of development of this uh, field. Around 2000, we built the first genome scale models. Uh, and they turned out to be predictive, and, and there was a lot of excitement for uh, the first five years. Maybe a little naive excitement, but we were excited about computations, algorithms, and so forth. Then right around 2005, uh, reality started setting in, uh, just understanding the magnitude of this challenge. And a lot of validation started happening. Uh, 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 interrogating knockout collections their, uh, and their properties, um, kind of um, synthetic biology or metabolic engineering applications materialized. And over the last two years now, these uh, genome scale models have allowed us to address fundamental biological questions that cannot be addressed in any other way. And there have been now three or four papers in, the, in Nature and Science over the last two years that have demonstrated this to be true. So I think um, uh, genome scale models uh, will uh, play a central role in biology going forward, not just uh, resource-wise, but also teaching-wise, as some people have uh, pointed out. And I think we're in for a, uh, an exciting uh, couple of uh, uh, decades ahead of us here. And uh, that is the end. <laughs>